study Ezekiel chapter 25, beginning at verse 1, reading verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against the Ammonites, and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, Aha, against my sanctuary when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel when it was desolate, and against the house of Judah when it went into captivity. Obviously, I'm keeping on reading. Indeed, therefore, I will deliver you as a possession to the men of the east, and they shall set their encampments among you and make their dwellings among you. They shall eat your fruit and they shall drink your milk. And I will make Rabbah a stable for camels and Ammon a resting place for flocks. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, because you clapped your hands, stamped your feet, rejoiced in, in heart with all your disdain for the land of Israel, indeed, therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and give you as plunder to the nations. I will cut you off from the peoples and I will cause you to perish from the countries. I will destroy you you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, let's begin with a brief introduction. Chapters 25 all the way to chapter 32 contain judgments that God begins to pronounce against seven nations, Gentile nations. Four of the nations that he begins to bring judgment on, four of those nations are singled out in chapter 25. And uh, these nations especially hate Israel and are especially jealous of that nation. When you begin to think about it, it makes sense that God begins to bring judgment against the Gentile nations because up to this point, He's been prophesying judgment against the nation of Israel. What this is going to do for us is it's going to help us to understand that God's judgment is impartial. Not only does He, in other words, speak a word of judgment against His people, the nation of Israel, but he also simply brings judgment on all who are sinners. Now, you see that throughout the Bible, but you see it very clearly in the book of Romans. When you study the book of Romans, you'll note that when Paul begins that book, when Paul begins writing his letter to the Romans, the first chapter deals with God uh, bringing judgment on Gentiles. Then chapter 2 in the book of Romans Paul begins to speak concerning God's judgment on the nation of Israel. And then when you get into chapter 3, he simply summarizes it by, by saying that all mankind comes under judgment by God. You see that in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, when it says, all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every single person, every single human being, whether Jew or Gentile, all fall under the same fact. Every person has sinned. There's not a single person outside of Jesus Christ who's ever lived who was sinless. So all sinned. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. We need to remember that, that Israel had been established by God to be a light. They were to be a shining light in the midst of spiritual darkness. And, and God's design for the nation of Israel was for them to reveal His salvation to the world. Paul makes reference about that in, in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 47, where it says there that Paul and Barnabas were speaking to, to Jews and, and said, The Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. The nation of Israel was established by God to be a light of salvation. God gave to them great, great uh, benefits and privileges. He gave them the Word of God. He gave them prophets. He gave them signs, wonders, miracles, a deliverer. He gave them so many benefits. And, and in their relationship with God, they had tremendous advantage. And, and you see that throughout the Scripture. God uh, gave to the nation of Israel tremendous advantage. And yet Israel had failed to represent God. What they had done is they entered in through a habit they had entered into a rebellion and idolatry, and uh, as, as a result of that, they actually began to emulate the nations surrounding them. Rather than being the light, they, they entered into darkness. It's similar today with the church. The church has been called to let our light so shine before men, Jesus said, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We have been called the light 
Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but if you follow me, you're not going to walk in darkness. You will have the light of life. And so if anyone says that they have a relationship with God who is light, yet they walk in darkness, John tells us in 1 John, they're lying and they're not telling the truth. Because the way to evidence that a person has a relationship with God is they live a life that is, is spiritually light. And, and, and people who are in the darkness will see that light and recognize their own darkness through just looking at the person who's living for God and comparing their own lives and the way that they're living. And so the nation of Israel was supposed to be living in a light. It was to be a light of the nations. And, and unfortunately, sadly, tragically, they failed to represent God. They entered into rebellion. They entered into idolatry. They emulated the surrounding nations. And so God brought judgment on them. And we've been seeing that. Not only does God bring judgment on them through, through the nation of Babylon, but God is going to bring judgment on the nations surrounding Israel. Now, the nations surrounding Israel falsely assumed that God had been overthrown. They felt that God had been overthrown because the nation of Israel was overthrown. And, and the way they thought they had tribal gods, the way they thought was simple. Babylon must have had superior gods because Babylon conquered Israel. Their tribal gods, the gods of Babylon, were greater than the God of Israel. And that's the way that they thought. That's how they thought at that time. So they falsely assumed that God had been overthrown when Israel was exiled. But in these chapters in front of us, chapters 25 through 32, Ezekiel is going to make it very clear that that's not the case at all. He makes it very clear that the one who's bringing judgment on the nation of Israel is the one who's bringing judgment on the nation surrounding Israel. And therefore, God has not been defeated by some pagan idol, some false god, but God is the one who's bringing judgment in the first place. And so he begins to speak to the Ammonites, and that's what we see here in the first few verses of chapter 25. Say to the Ammonites, hear the word of the Lord. So he's speaking to a group of people called Ammonites. Ammonites lived in what is today modern Jordan. It's just east of the Jordan River. They were descendants of a man named Lot. Lot was a, was a nephew of uh, Abram. And uh, the way that the Ammonite nation came into being is Lot had an incestuous relationship with his younger daughter. That's recorded in Genesis chapter 19, verses 37 and 38. And so their origin was in incest. And what happens is in 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 2, it reveals there that, that the Ammonites joined with the Babylonians against Israel. And so God is bringing judgment on them. But what is it that really causes God to be so greatly angry? Well, notice with me in verse 3, he, he tells us, Say to the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, Because you said, Aha, against my sanctuary when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel when it was desolate, and against the house of Judah when they went into captivity. Now notice verse 6. Thus says the Lord God, because you clapped your hands, stamped your feet, and rejoiced in heart with all your disdain for the land of Israel. Why is it that God is so angry? It's because they rejoiced when Israel was overthrown. They rejoiced when Israel was exiled. They were rejoiced when the temple was profaned because when that temple was profaned, it was belittling the holiness and majesty, the honor of God. And so God says, because you rejoice to see this take place, I am going to deal with you. And what's going to happen is you're going to be taken by the people of the east. They're going to come. Notice verse 4, I will deliver you as a possession to the men of the east. They shall set up their encampments among you Make the dwellings among you. They shall eat your fruit. They shall drink your milk. I will make Rabbah a stable for camels, Ammon a resting place for flocks. These are cities there in, in the Ammonite uh, territory and all. And so he's simply saying you're going to be completely dominated by invaders. And the reason is going to be because of your disdain for the nation of Israel. You rejoiced. You rejoiced to see my sanctuary when it was profaned. You rejoiced in that. And because you did, I'm going to deal with you. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 16 says, All those who devour you shall be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall become plunder. 
And all who pray upon you, I will make a prey. And that's what God is going to do here with the Ammonites. He said, I'm going to deal with you. You have caused me anger. You rejoice to see my temple profaned. You rejoiced. You stamped your feet. You clapped your hand. You, you were so glad. You, you were overjoyed. He says, I'm going to deal with you. And I'm going to bring you into judgment. And I want you to notice how he says in verse 7, at the very, uh, very last portion, I will destroy you. And you shall know that I am the Lord. You're going to know my wrath. You're going to know my wrath when I bring it upon you, and that's going to make you very sure that there is a God in Israel. Now he goes on in verse 8 to prophesy against Moab. Thus says the Lord God, be, because Moab and Seir say, Look, the, the house of Judah is like all the nations. Therefore, behold, I will clear the territory of Moab of cities, of the cities on its frontier, the glory of the, of the country, Beth Yeshemoth, Baal Meon, and Kirjathaim. To the men of the east, I will give it as a possession, together with the Ammonites, that the Ammonites may not be remembered among the nations, and I will execute judgments upon Moab, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Again, he's saying, you're going to know that I'm the Lord because I'm bringing my wrath upon you. Now, Moab was descended from Lot also, and his oldest daughter, again in Genesis 19. These people were located just south of Ammon. And their, their sin is, is told to us here. They rejoice at Israel's judgment. And they considered Israel like all other nations. Moab was destroyed by the Babylonians five years after the destruction of the temple. And Jeremiah 48 and Jeremiah 49 predicts uh, that they ultimately will be restored. But God is saying, I will execute judgment upon Moab. They shall know that I am the Lord. Moving on, prophecy against Edom. Thus says the Lord God, because of what Edom did against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and has greatly offended by avenging itself on them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand against Edom, cut off man and beast from it, and make it desolate from Teman, Dedan, shall fall by the sword. I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel, that they may do in Edom according to my anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, says the Lord God. Edom. When you're looking at the Jordan River, Jordan River providing the border for the nation of Israel to the east, you see Ammon, then south of that you see Moab, and then you go further south and you now are in Edom. Edom was made up of descendants of Jacob's brother Esau. And their sin was that they constantly over the centuries had a settled hatred and hostility towards Israel. So God said, listen, you have hated Israel for so long, you need to know that Israel ultimately will conquer you one time for all time. Now that did happen, by the way. That happened in history through the Maccabees in 164 B.C. and then through somebody named John Hyrcanus in 126 B.C. And so you see what we're getting is just a simple pattern. God saying to each one of these nations, I'm bringing judgment. And then he speaks against Philistia. Thus says the Lord God, verse 15, because the Philistines dealt vengefully and took vengeance with a spiteful heart to destroy because of the old hatred. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will cut off the Carathites and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. I will execute great vengeance on them with furious rebukes and they shall know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. Uh, the Philistines had a, had a long history of opposition to the nation of Israel. It continued for, for centuries in their history. They hated the Jews, and, and they were spiteful towards the nation. They had a, a spiteful heart and a vengeful, vengeful hatred towards the nation of Israel. And so what happens with them is they ultimately were dealt with by the Babylonians when the Babylonians invaded in 588. Now, one of the things that we see as we look at this, and you, you'll note something very br briefly. I was talking to Mike today, and I was kind of rehearsing some of this Bible study with him, and I said, you know, the fact of the matter is, I said, I could give this Bible study in about 10 minutes. I said, because basically what God is simply saying is the same thing over and over again. I'm going to destroy you. All right, so so I, I practiced some tap dancing and some card tricks because... <laughs> We need to spend about 35, 40 minutes here. Now, actually, you can look at this and you can see that, but what you're getting is a pattern. The pattern is a very simple one. 
God is simply saying this. He's saying, you have had spiteful vengeance, you have had hatred, you had a prolonged rejection of, you have just a, a constant settled disposition of wrath towards my people. You think that because I brought judgment on them through Babylon that, that you're going to get away with your sins, and it doesn't work that way. You are equally guilty because you equally are sinful. Now, the nation of Israel, obviously having great benefits, also had a great responsibility before the Lord. The more you know, the more you owe. God had given to them so many opportunities and so much that naturally God would bring a strong judgment against the nation of Israel. But that doesn't exempt people. That doesn't exempt the people surrounding them, especially those who are rejoicing over what has taken place in that nation. And so God begins to, to speak through that. He begins to speak concerning all of these nations that have a history of hatred for, for His people. All of these nations were jealous, and every one of them were vindictive towards the nation of Israel. And, and, and in God's judgment on the nation of Israel, they, they failed to learn uh, that, that God is a holy God. They also didn't learn that God loved the nation and did not understand that, that seeing that God loved the nation, He would also judge those who hated her. You can look in the Old Testament all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 32, verses 9 and 10. And, and it reads there, the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He, speaking of God, encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. God loves the nation of Israel, and God reserves the right to judge his own people. But he also will judge those who spitefully treat his people. This is because he made an everlasting covenant with Abram. Remember with me in Genesis, in chapter 12, all the way back in the first book of the Bible, how when God was telling Abram to get up from where he was and to move into a land that he would show him, God in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, said to Abram, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's promise to the nation of Israel was made all the way back before Israel existed as a nation. When God began to speak to the father of Israel, Abram, and said, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give you children. And if you could look into the, the sky and count the number of the stars, if you could count the, the grains of sand, you'd be able to count the multitude that will call you Father. He was saying to them, I'm going to bless you, and, and I will be with you. And the ones who bless you, I will bless. And the one who curses you, I will curse. I guess the question has to be asked, What was true then? And even as we see this taking place now, I mean, here in this passage here, God is saying, I'm going to deal with all of you nations. This is how you treated my nation. My, this is how you treated my, my wife, if you will. This is how you treated my people. One has to ask the question, does that blessing and that cursing continue to exist to this day? Is God's eye still on the nation of Israel? And does God still promise to bless those who bless Israel? I happen to be part of a group of people, many millions, really, who believe that that promise continues to exist to this day. And I think it is a wise thing for us as a nation. I believe especially it's a wise thing for us as the church to have a, a loving support for the, the people of God, the nation of Israel. And, and what we do is we pray that God will open their eyes to to the Messiah, Jesus, that they might come to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we've gone to Israel and we've had um, guides with us, over, over time, most of the guides that we've ever had have been um, Jewish, Jewish men or Jewish women who uh, don't have a relationship with Messiah at all. They're either Reformed or Orthodox Jews. And uh, every time we've gone to Israel over the years, we've had opportunity to, um, to, in our Bible studies, share the gospel, 
to share the gospel, just to continue to open the word and to say, this is the Messiah. This is what Jesus does. This is how Jesus works. This is what God did. Because it's our hope and it's our desire and it's our prayer that those whom we come into contact with will have opportunity to, to commit themselves to Messiah, to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We really do believe that God wants to do a work in that nation. We read our Bibles and we see that God promises that he will. And so God's promise of blessing has been on, on that nation from the time of Abram. And, and those who bless Israel, God says, I will bless. I honestly believe that this nation that we call the United States has been so wonderfully blessed over the years because we have had a support for that nation. We have as a, as a people. And I pray that we continue to do so. I pray that we continue to have that kind of attitude towards that nation and that we don't withhold our prayers and, and our help and our support when necessary from that nation. It's a very important thing for us to continue doing. God said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, moving into chapter 26, he brings judgment on Tyre. It came to pass in the 11th year, on the first day of the month, this month obviously is an unnamed month, that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken, who was the gateway of the peoples. Now she is turned over to me. I shall be filled. She's laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you as the sea causes its waves to come up. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre, break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her, make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for spreading nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken, says the Lord God, it shall become plunder for the nations. Also her daughter villages, also her daughter villages which are in the field shall be slain by the sword. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses, with chariots, with horsemen, and an army with many people. He will slay with the sword your daughter villages in the fields. He will heap up a siege mound against you, build a wall against you, and raise a defense against you. He will direct his battering rams against your walls, and with his axes he will break down your towers. Because of the abundance of his horses, their dust will cover you. Your walls will shake at the noise of the horsemen, the wagons, and the chariots when he enters your gates as men enter a city that has been breached. With the hooves of his horses, he will trample all your streets. He'll slay your people by the sword. Your strong pillars will fall to the ground. They will plunder your riches and pillage your merchandise. They'll break down your walls, destroy your pleasant houses. They'll lay your stones, your timber, your soil in the midst of the water. I will put an end to the sound of your songs. The sound of your harps shall be heard no more. I will make you like the top of a rock. You shall be a place for spreading nets. You shall never be rebuilt. For I, the Lord, have spoken, says the Lord God. The prophecy against Tyre actually covers chapters 26 through 28. What you have here is a city, an ancient city that was a commercial center. This city of Tyre was extremely prosperous, was very wealthy. At one time in its history, Tyre was friendly towards Israel. They even had a king who helped David as well as Solomon who built the temple. In later years, though, Tyre turned against the nation of Israel. They actually sold Jews as slaves to Greeks and Edomites. You see that in the, the book of Joel, chapter 3. Now, Tyre was a commercial center. She was in the middle of the Mediterranean. And she was, she, was, she was well known for having tremendous commercial enterprises and great wealth. And what happens is Tyre begins to rejoice when Jerusalem is ruined because that opens the door for her commercial success. You see, with Israel out of the way, she's going to become even more rich and even more powerful. Her caravans can now enjoy free passage, and they're going to become even richer because no longer will she have to pay taxes when she enters into Israel. So what she's doing is she's rejoicing. She's rejoicing over the fall of the nation. What happens 
And this is interesting, and I'm going to develop this with you a little bit. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, actually came with his armies. And what he did is he devastated Tyre. He reduced, it, reduced the city of Tyre to rubble. Now, Tyre was actually a city that was built on the coast, but also about a half mile off the coast was an island. And um, what happened is the people who were in the coastal city of Tyre, when Nebuchadnezzar came in, many of them escaped across that water and took refuge in a fortress there on the island right off the coast, and they were able to survive. Now, the mainland city under Nebuchadnezzar was reduced to rubble, and it was scraped. But these people who were there on the island actually survived the attack, and they actually thought that they were going to make it. Now, in 322, there was a, a young man by the name of Alexander, Alexander the Great. And Alexander was making his way in that region, and he came to Tyre. When he came to Tyre, the people who were there on that island felt themselves to be secure because here he came with an army, and they're a half mile off the shoreline, and they for certain believed that they were going to survive Alexander. I read somewhere that stated that they actually even mocked him. Like, there's no way you can get us. We're, there's no way you, there was no navy at that time. They didn't see a navy with Alexander, and therefore they thought themselves to be secure. But what did Alexander do? Now, everybody knows that he's called the great for a good reason. He began to think through, what am I going to do? He had all of these soldiers with him, and he began to take all the rubble that was there, the remains of the, of the city of Tyre, and they began to bring it and pour it into the sea. And they scraped and scraped even the dirt they took off until they built a causeway, a bridge, that went from the shoreline to the island. And then the navy also came in because they had plenty of time for the navy to come. And these people who were there in Tyre who felt themselves so secure thinking that there was no way anybody was going to get to them actually ended up being destroyed by Alexander. And because Alexander came and scraped everything and, and removed all of the debris and everything and poured it into the, into the ocean, the prophecy that God gives is 100% fulfilled. God make the, made them, like it says in verse 14, I will make you like the top of a rock. That's what happened. They came and they were able to remove everything and it was just like an empty rock there because everything was taken and dumped into the ocean. They sacked the city and the army and the naval forces combined destroyed them. It became almost completely barren. It became a place where the fishermen would dry out their nets. Now, in the fourth century, people who were called the Saracens came and destroyed what was left of that once great city. And to this very day, it remains barren, exactly what God had said would take place. You shall never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken, saith the Lord God. And so these people had a false sense of security. They thought for sure that there was no way that anything harmful would take place. They thought they were going to make it. There was no way that anybody was going to get to them. But the fact is, it was a false sense of security because in reality, God's word is true. And so here comes Alexander. He scrapes everything, pours it into the sea. Now, there have been people who have tried to find the remains of Tyre. You can find Sidon. Sidon has remained populated over the centuries in one form or another. But you go to Tyre, and Tyre and Sidon, were, they call them sister cities, you can go into that region, and you cannot find the exact location, though you do find places that they have, uh, they have excavated certain pottery shards and things like that. But the bottom line is, is that city has never been rebuilt, and it never will be. Now, as the Lord is speaking concerning this, verse 15, thus says the Lord God to Tyre, will the coastlands not shake at the sound of your fall when the wounded cry, when slaughter is made in the midst of you? Then all the princes of the sea will come down from their thrones, lay aside their robes, take off their embroidered garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They'll sit on the ground, tremble every moment, and be astonished at you. And they will take up lamentation for you and say to you, How you have perished, O one inhabited by seafaring men, O renowned city, who was strong at sea, she and her inhabitants, who caused their terror to be on all her inhabitants. 
Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall. Yes, the coastlands by the sea are troubled at your departure. I mean, it would be like a major city in the United States suddenly ceasing to exist. It would be like Los Angeles, a port city, or San Francisco, or San Diego, or New York, or any great port city, Boston, just destroyed, annihilated, wiped out. Suddenly it's gone. And the people who had profited from her and her trade and all the merchandise, the people see this and, and, and even the royalty of that time fell down on the ground saying, I can't believe it. This is terrible. The devastation that took place. And God is saying, this takes place because of your attitude towards my people. This is a nation that actually, or a city rather, that actually had colonies. She had planted colonies in places like Cyprus and Rhodes and Malta and Spain and Sicily, Sardinia, in Africa. And so it's regarded as a genuine calamity. She was rich and she had prestige. She had all of that, but she was also filled with sin. And the royalty mourns at her destruction as they see this taking place. Well, God says in verse 19, Thus says the Lord God, When I make you a desolate city like cities that are not inhabited, when I bring the deep upon you and great waters cover you, then I will bring you down with those who descend into the pit to the people of old, and I will make you dwell in the lowest part of the earth in places desolate from antiquity with those who go down to the pit so that you may never be inhabited, and I shall establish glory in the land of the living, and I will make you a terror and you shall be no more Though you are sought for, you will never be found again, says the Lord God. You know, when you think of cities like Los Angeles or San Francisco, when you think of cities, especially as I consider cities like San Francisco, San, I haven't been to San Francisco in a long time. You know, I normally don't go up north, so I very seldom have ever really had to go into San Francisco, though I have on occasion been in San Francisco, I can tell you that uh, as I remember it, and some of you have had recent visits there, San Francisco is a, in, in just overall terms of just an incredible city and artsy and, you know, all those things that a lot of people like. It's just an amazing city. I mean, by the wharf and, and just, there's just so many things to see and to do there. And, and a lot of people love San Francisco, the city on the bay. They, they love it. They even see, sing songs about it. They used to sing songs about San Francisco. And uh, an amazing city, a city with an interesting history. I mean, um, prisoners used to be dropped off there before it was actually a, a bustling city. They used to, uh, the English would come and uh, just drop off their prisoners off the coast there in San Francisco, and they'd swim to San Francisco, and, and that's kind of like the origin of the city there, a lot of prisoners and criminals who'd been released. And uh, to this day, it's just an amazing city, but it's an amazingly debauched city too, to be honest with you, and you know that. I mean, I'm not saying anything to people who don't know that. It's a debauched city. Interesting uh, mayor of the city has all kinds of twisted ways of thinking, and it's just a twisted city in many ways, beautiful in one way and very, very twisted in others. So imagine if, if suddenly there was an earthquake and suddenly San Francisco is wiped off the face of the earth. There would be quite an interesting response. On the one hand, you'd have quite a number of people who would mourn the loss of that city, not because people died, but because of its commerce, because of its trade, because of its, its finance, because it was a center of activity and because it was cultural in many ways. They wouldn't necessarily mourn so much about people in terms of individual sorrow over the loss of life so much as just the entire city itself would be devastated. And I think that many of the intelligentsia and the artsy types would, would, would be thinking in that way. Then you'd have people on the other side, um, people who would say, God judged them and that's good. You know, and to me, I think that that's not a good way to think either. You know, that's not a good way to think either because there are a lot of people there that the Lord wants to save and probably is going to save. And so we have to have more of a charitable mentality. Yet at the same time, what we end up with is we end up with a city that's been destroyed. When that tsunami hit a few years ago, 
and you go into Thailand and you go into the city that we traveled into and you see the devastation. You can, you can see the pain and you start hearing the stories. The story that this man told us of how his, his child was swept, swept out to sea right in front of him. There was nothing to think, not a thing he could do as he watched his baby being dragged out and lost forever. People climbing on trees and being ripped out of the trees and story after story that we heard when we ministered there, it breaks your heart for these people. New Orleans is, is hit by, by a hurricane and devastated. It awakens people up and the charitable hearts that many Americans have respond with, with immediate help and aid because the city has been devastated. And indeed, I think that we ought to respond in that way. But when Tyre is destroyed, the merchants and, and the royalty are upset because of the commerce that has been lost and don't have the ability to see that, that in reality what happened to that great city was the God of Israel judged it. The God of Israel judged the city because that city rejoiced in, in the pain of the nation of Israel. Their greed and their materialism drove them to be glad they could now enter into Israel without having to pay taxes. And God said, I'm going to make you into a place where they spread nets. I'm going to make you like a tabletop. You're going to be completely devoid of any inhabitants. And you're never going to be rebuilt again. God is going to make them desolate. That's what he's saying in verse 19. Thus says the Lord God, when I make you a desolate city, like cities that are not inhabited, when I bring the deep upon you and great waters cover you. It's like a picture of a tsunami, if you will, a great wave that hits. Then I will bring you down with those who descend into the pit, the people of old. When he speaks of this, I'm going to bring you down like those who descend into the pit. That word, the pit, is a Hebrew word for dungeon or a cistern or a prison. It's a picture of where the dead are placed. What God is saying is even as those in the past are dead and buried, even so you too are going to die because the city is going to be destroyed. So I'll bring you down with those who descend into the pit to the people of old, and, and I will make you dwell in the lowest part of the earth. You're going to die in places desolate from antiquity with those who go down to the pit that, so that you may never be inhabited. I'm going to wipe you out and I shall establish glory in the land of the living. It's going to be a testimony of my majesty. I will make you a terror. You shall be no more. Though you are sought for, you will never be found again, says the Lord. I will make you a terror. You shall be no more. Tyre has never been rebuilt. As I mentioned earlier, Sidon, her sister city, exists, but not Tyre. God's word is true. And when God said, I'm going to bring a word of judgment, I'm going to bring an action of judgment, God did. Now, when God says, I'm going to bring judgment, that ought to cause our hearts to fear because the reality is, is that God is a God who can bring judgment. But at the same time, God also says, I'm going to save you from judgment. And that's what he did through Jesus Christ. To bring it to a New Testament kind of concept, the bottom line is, yes, God brings judgment to the nation of Israel, brought judgment on the nations that plagued her and rejoiced at her failure. But God is a God also of mercy, and God is a, a God of compassion, and God is a God who forgives, and God is a God who makes all things new, and God is a God who can do a work in our lives and save us from having to enter into condemnation. You see, when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't enter into condemnation. You're passed from death into life. When we as believers came to a relationship with God, it's the same word where God is on one, one hand promising judgment. It's the same word when God is giving a promise of salvation. And so we have opportunities to make a, a choice. Is it going to be judgment that I enter into or salvation? If God's word is true, and indeed it is, and we can look at history and we can see to this day that Tyre doesn't exist, and we can look at, and we can say, yes, Alexander in 322 B.C. did exactly what God had stated he would do in the book of Ezekiel a few hundred years, 200, over 200 years before, before Alexander came and did exactly what God said would happen. 
If I can look and see that this is a sure word of prophecy, if I can look and I can see that God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he not said and shall he not do it? When I look and I see how God works and God's work is true, then I can take him and I can take him at face value. So if he says I'll bring judgment, he's going to. But when he says I will show you mercy, he does that too. And so I have a tendency of embracing the grace and mercy of God. I see the work of judgment and I'm warned by it. God's word is true. It's like what Jesus said. Jesus said you're supposed to choose. You cannot serve God, he says, and, 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 and material things. You have to make a choice. What's it going to be? Is it going to be serving me with everything that you have within you? Or is it going to be serving the world? Now, if it's going to be serving the world, get all you can out of it because that's all you get. That's it. It's like that woman this man was married to. The man was unregenerate. The man was an unbeliever at all. He... He actually took advantage of his wife because his wife was a Christian. And he would go out with the guys and he'd hang around at the bar and all of that. And one night he was at the bar with some friends and, and he turns to his friends and he says, I've got a great wife. If I come home right now with you guys, it was one in the morning, if I come home right now with you guys, my wife is in bed. I'll wake her up. If I wake her up, she's going to get up and if I say to her, make us something to eat, without a word, she's going to make us something to eat. And his friends, they've been drinking pretty much all night, say, I don't believe that at all. He says, well, then come with me. And so they go home. He walks into the house, and he's drunk. And he walks up and opens the door to her room and walks in and says, I got some friends with me. We're hungry. Get up and make us something to eat. Without a word, his wife gets up, walks to the kitchen, makes something to eat, serves the men that he brings, kisses her husband good night, goes back to bed. And there they are eating. And they finally turn and say, why'd she do that? And the guy said, I don't know. She does those kinds of things. She's a Christian. She's a Christian. She just does these things. I do this all the time. And she never gets mad. She doesn't say anything. She just, just does it. She's a Christian. Well, somebody asked her, why do you do it? And she said, my husband's unsaved. And his future is hell. She said, so I want to give him the best life that he can have <laughs> because when he dies, he's going to hell. Now, in a way, that's funny, but it's also very, very practical. Instead of making his life even more miserable, she said, I want to give him as much joy as he gets because that's all he's going to get. That's all he'll ever have. Listen, if you don't know the Lord tonight, what you have right now is the best it's going to get. It's the best it's going to get. And if you're miserable, that's the best it's going to get. It doesn't get any better. It only gets worse over time. That's a fact. If you're a believer, this is really the worst it's going to be. Because when we're with the Lord, there's no pain, there's no tear, there's no sorrow, there's no sin, there's no sickness. There's just joy. It's, you're in the presence of God. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. And when you're in the face, you see in the face of God, when you're there, there's no more pain. There's no more suffering. There's none of this. None of, it's all gone. So in reality, this is the worst that we're going to have, but it's the best that somebody who doesn't have a relationship with God ever will have. And so for me, I made that choice a long time ago. I made that choice, you know, when I was 20 years old. I said, what is it that I would want from life? Do I want what I have right now, which is actually going downhill at the age of 20? Or do I want something that actually is, is going to end up with a benefit and a blessing that's beyond anything I can imagine? It only makes sense to me to choose the thing that's going to be best, which is what I did when I committed my heart to Christ. God's Word is true. He says you can have judgment, which is called also in the New Testament condemnation, or you can pass from judgment into life. You can have one or the other. Which is it going to be? I made that choice. Like Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. Jesus said, you cannot serve God and you cannot serve mammon. Jesus said, if you are not gathering with me, you're scattering. You know, even believers who have bad influence because they're backsliders and don't really care about God are scatterers. 
because the friends that they have in school, the friends that they have on the job site that are miserable, that are putting on the brave face or the happy face, but in reality their hearts are far from God and they're miserable people, the ones that we admire so much and wish we were just like, not knowing their real life, not knowing what's really going on. It has all that appearance that it's so cool and so good and it's got everything going for them. When in reality, we don't see them crying at night by themselves because they're lonely or miserable because they don't have any self-confidence because they don't have anything going for them. We don't see that. All we see is on the job, they look so cool. They're in shape and they've got dates and they've got plenty of money. We see things like that. That's all we see and we want to be like that. When in reality, what we ought to be is living for Christ in such a way that they'd look at us and say, I want to be like you. I want you. You have. What is it that you have? But we don't do that, do we? What we end up doing is we end up wanting to be like them and we scatter instead of gather because we're an influence on them to the negative. God's Word tells us that we can have a relationship with Him, that He can fill us with His Spirit, that in His presence is joy. He tells us that His Holy Spirit will bring us peace and love and all the things that we desire but can't buy and can't find outside of Him. And yet we listen to the whispered lies of the enemy so much and say, oh yeah, you must be telling us the truth this time and are seduced into deception and we end up in misery. God's Word is true. When God says, I can forgive you, he will. When God says, I can give you a new life, he will. When God says that I can do these things beyond your comprehension, I can give you a peace that is beyond your understanding, he does. Because he's God. Because his word is true. So God looks at the nations, and he says, my nation Israel, my, my people have been rebellious and idolatrous. Instead of being a light before these nations, these heathens, instead of being a light living for me and, and, and being such an evidence of my presence that, that the pagan nations surrounding them would come to them and say, we want to go with you because we know that God is with you. What they ended up doing is going with the pagans saying, we want to go with you because it looks like you're having a better time than we are. And as a result, God said, I brought judgment on my people. But as you nations surrounding Israel have been laughing at them and rejoicing at them and glad that my temple was desecrated, well, I want you to know that you're not going to get away with that. So I will bring judgment on you, Ammon. I will bring judgment on you, Moab. I will bring judgment on you, Edom. I will bring judgment on you, Philistines. I will bring judgment on you on you all for what you have done. But for us, in the 21st century, I look back at this and I take warning and I say, God, your word is true. You did bring judgment, tire fell, but you also bring blessing because you've been a blessing in my life through your son, Jesus Christ. I would rather choose life than to end up making the wrong choice and being judged. That's a choice that we all can make. We can make that choice tonight.